Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. There's a lot of truth in the old saw about the loss of a horseshoe nail resulting in the loss of a kingdom. The tiniest detail can often lead to quite extraordinary results, particularly if the detail is observed by a clever con man with sufficient larceny in his soul. A man like the amazing Dr. Alcazar, who parlayed a piece of string into a small fortune. Listen. Listen, then, as Mr. Vincent Price stars in The Green and Gold String, which begins exactly one minute from now. That dulcet voice belongs to Abby, my good and devoted assistant who stands outside my studio here in Coney Island and drums up business. Of course, I wrote his spiel. And did it pay off one evening last fall? Oh, uh, thank you kindly. Good evening, sir. Uh, are you Dr. Alcazar? Alcazar, indeed I am, madam, at your service. Oh, uh, I'd like a reading, if you don't mind. Hmm. Age 35 to 40, cheap purse, expensive suit, suit too tight and too short, not hers, a hand-me-down accent, British cockney, nervous. Hmm. Something on her mind, possibly a housekeeper or a lady's maid. I showed it to the chair reserved for customers. It's under a mirror. Ah, they're handy mirrors. <laughs> Spooky in here, I it, with all these black curtains? Uh, black velvet, madam, to minimize all distraction. Is that your crystal ball? Uh, yes, madam, the mysterious orb in which I see revealed the future as well as the past. But in your case, I think it won't be needed. Your psychic projection is extremely strong. Even now, I can clearly sense that... That what? That you're deeply troubled. Well... In a way, I, I am all upset, Lloyd. But, uh, you see, sir, it's a private matter, and... Uh, of course, of course. Uh, may I suggest that you relax as much as possible? Any undue tension disturbs and obfuscates your aura. And in order to obtain closer contact with your psyche, I'd like to hold some personal possession. Oh, no, 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 not your brooch. No personal jewelry. Its intrinsically counteractive density tends to adumbrate the necessary metaphysic radiation. It does? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, perhaps something in your purse, hmm? Or a key. That's another gambit in the little game I play. By leaning back and half-closing my eyes, I can watch the mirror and see the contents of an open purse. In hers, I saw a roll of stamps, a shabby wallet, a half-eaten candy bar... A postmarked envelope addressed to Miss Lily, Lily something or other. A folded, neatly folded sheet of tissue paper, violet colored, wrapped around a length of gift wrapping cord, interwoven strands of green and gold, hairpin, a compact. Will this do? Uh, your compact. Excellent, excellent. Now, to sense the vibrations. Your name. Your name... You are named for a flower. Yes, a lily. Oh, well, I never. 
Do you have a fondness for candy, a sweet tooth? Oh, I know. I find it awful. Your present life is bound up with a person of great wealth. I think a woman. <gasps> it's the truth, everywhere. You have a highly sensitive anima and are therefore a most sympathetic subject. You are an excellent seamstress and... Uh... And that, madam, concludes the general reading. Oh, is that all? Well, I could go deeper, much deeper, with a special delineation for an additional 50 cents. Uh, shall I continue? All right, uh... Uh, I guess you might as well. Excellent, excellent. Now, if you'll state your problem briefly. Oh? Do I have to? I should think you'd already know. I see Madam finds it necessary to test me further. Very well. Well, now, I seem to see paper, tissue paper. What a strange color. Almost orchid. <gasps> orchid colored paper and something else. Two colors interwoven, green and gold, green and gold. Ooh. Have I mentioned something which frightens you? Oh, yes. Oh, well, now you should have sufficient proof of my powers. And since my time is limited, I suggest you tell me the rest of the details. Hmm? Well, it's about my miss... My sister. My sister and her husband. You see, sir, I, I've just found out that... He's deceiving her like, and I'm the only one that knows. Uh, the eternal triangle. Oh, no, it's nothing like that. Oh? That's why I, I don't rightly know what to do. The funny thing is that what he's doing to deceive her is making her happy. Now, my problem is, should I tell my sister, or should I let well enough alone? I see, I see, I see. You are entangled, madam, in the most unusual Psychic web. Now, uh, one moment, one moment. There are widely differentiated karmas here. Two paths lie before you. I see you taking one and then the other, but it makes no difference which you follow. For whatever you do, the result will be the same. And there now, I, I trust your mind has been set at rest, huh? You mean that's all, sir? Apparently all that fate intends you to know, at least for the present. Well, if you say so. That will be one dollar and a half. I'd forgotten all about the mousy little woman until three days later. Abby and I were having breakfast in the diner near the subway station. I was scanning the morning paper while I half listened to Abby's cheerful and rather uh, witless you know, this time chatter. Last year we was already in Miami Beach. Remember, boss? Mm. We traveled in mm. style, but playing mm. it. Yeah, this year looks like we won't even scrape up enough scratch for bus fare. It would be a laugh if we were stuck here all winter. Oh, Lily Morton. <laughs> I thought her last name began with an M. Poor wench that same night. What you talking about? And the old friend, spare not. We may winter in the sun after all. How come? Look at this picture. Recall that face? Huh? No, why? Three nights ago on Friday, you ushered her into the studio. Oh, one of the suckers, huh? So what's she done to get in the paper? She got herself murdered, poor soul, that same night, yeah? It seems she worked as a maid up in Rockland County. She took a late bus back there from New York, and walking from the bus to the house where she worked, well, she encountered someone who strangled her. Oh, it's tough. But how does that make us any dog? Listen to this. Gloria Druce, former luminary of the New York stage, now Mrs. Clinton de Vries, today expressed great sorrow over the brutal murder of her personal maid, Lily Morton. Declaring that she wanted to do everything possible to help bring the murderer to justice, Miss Truth said she was posting a reward of five thousand dollars. Five grand? And you know who done it? No, no, but I have a hunch, and I have an idea how. Uh, uh, let me see now. I need proper clothes, cutaways, striped trousers for you. A uh, chauffeur's cap should suffice. And we need a car, a limousine. A which? Abby, how much money do you have? For what? Working capital. To make money, you have to spend money. I've got about 28 bucks and some chicken feed. And I have less than five. I have it. My two $50 gold pieces. With them, we'll have a total You of... ain't going to spend them. You always said they was for good luck. Uh, so I did, Abby. And here is the good luck I've been waiting for. 
That afternoon, we arranged to rent a limousine, a 1938 Rolls, which I felt exactly suited my persona. We also rented the necessary clothes, and the next day we set out to visit Mrs. Clinton DeVries, nay Gloria Drew. Uh, what's the name of the place? Leonard's Cove. You'll see the sign. Oh, gotcha. You know, I never even heard of this name, Gloria Drew. Never heard of her, the greatest Juliet of our century, the theater's fairest ornament for more than a generation. I noticed you had a look around. Merely to refresh my recollection. After all, she's been in retirement for more than ten years. Oh, then she couldn't be any spring chicken. A woman like Gloria Druce is ageless. But it's my guess she's on the dark side of 50. Now, look, Abby, uh, while I'm talking to her, I wish you'd somehow manage to get inside the house. Get acquainted with the servants. Well, huh? Sure, that'll be a cinch. Uh, what should I find out? Anything and everything, but your main assignment is... Mr. Clinton DeVries. Dr. Alcazar, is Mrs. DeVries expecting you? No, unfortunately, I was... Who is it, Edward? A Dr. Alcazar, madam. Alcazar? I don't believe I knew... Madam, forgive me for taking this liberty, but... He says it's about Miss Lily. Lily? Oh, come into the library, doctor. Thank you, thank you. Ay, what a charming room... A perfect setting for you, Miss Truth. I beg your pardon, uh, Mrs. DeVries. Oh, don't apologize. I like it when people remember. Oh, now what is this about Lily? If you have any information, shouldn't you have gone to the police? Oh, but I've come here seeking information from you. Uh, perhaps you'll let me explain. Oh, please do. Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. Now then, you see, Mrs. DeVries, I'm a metaphysician, a sort of professor of the occult. Oh. But understand, madam. I have never used my powers or knowledge for personal financial gain, only in the interest of science. What has all this to do with Lily? Well, recently, about ten days ago, I was engaged in a simple experiment with my crystal ball, in the course of which I encountered a very unusual interruption of the comic stream, a total picture of a woman in distress, a woman in dire danger, seeking help, at the time, I made a full notation of the occurrence and then put the matter from my mind until yesterday. Yes? At the home of friends in Baltimore, I chanced to look at a New York newspaper. Lily Morton's photograph caught my eye. And you think it was Lily you saw in the crystal? That is the question, Miss Truth, which has brought me all these miles to see you. Why, this is fascinating. Please, if you will permit me, I'd like to discuss the face I saw. Yes, please go ahead. I saw a woman, part of her form, but dimly, but I saw her features very clearly, a rather plain, almost homely face, Welsh, perhaps English, colorless hair, plainly dressed, close-set gray eyes, no makeup, a mole here near the right ear, one gold cap tooth, upper left incisor, Yes, it is Lily. You're quite sure? Oh, yes, there can't be any doubt. <sighs> well, Miss Druth, you have set my mind at rest. I, I can't thank you enough. Oh, you're not leaving. I mean, aren't you going to try to find out more? I, I don't think I understand. Well, uh, Doctor, in these few minutes, you have convinced me completely. I'm greatly honored. And I was thinking, suppose you try to get in touch with Lily... Wherever she is, or, or isn't that possible? Well, of course, I have often received messages from the beyond, but... Then, but... then you could find out who killed her. Oh, but, madam, don't you think the police... The police, they haven't found a single clue. Oh, won't you please try? Well, it's a challenge. Though I must warn you, it's not likely to succeed. <laughs> Nothing. The crystal is entirely blank. I'm wasting your time, dear lady. Oh, please. Don't give up yet. Well, as you wish. Ah, here is something. It, it's clouding. Now the mists are clearing. A woman's figure? No. No, it's gone. All I see is a serpent. No. No, apparently it's a rope, but oddly colored, interwoven strands of green and gold. The colors of the rope are, are vivid against a background of violet. It's a peculiar shade of violet. Oh. It looks... Oh, but the light's fading. The mists are closing in. Oh, I'm sorry. The image is gone. I'm truly sorry. 
I think we're being misled. You mean because what you saw hadn't anything to do with Lily? Exactly. No, it wasn't about Lily. It was about me. You? Yes. Just a minute. Doctor, is this the same shade of violet? Yes. Yes, this is what I saw. The same violet tissue paper and this interwoven green and gold string. But why? It was such a powerful image. Has this any emotional meaning, Mr. Tabree? Well, yes, it has. It has to do with George. So that's your husband's name? Oh, no, no. George is an old admirer of mine, of Gloria Drews. Not Gloria DeVries. I've never seen him. I don't know his real name. We just call him George. And this paper and string is what he always wraps his presents in. An old admirer who sends you presents. It's most romantic. Isn't it? There's no note with his gift. No, no address, nothing. Except in the very first one. That was nearly two years ago. He enclosed an old theater program from The Green and the Gold. Ah, The Green and the Gold. Oh, remember. <laughs> oh, yes, I saw you in that. I'll never forget it. Well, that's how I know he's an admirer. You don't know what it means to an old actress, Doctor. To be remembered. Ah, yes. Yes. Uh, what sort of gifts does he send? Oh, books, perfume, our little knick-knack. No candy? Oh, yes. Every third or fourth package, heavenly liqueur chocolate. Ah, yes, I'm sure they're delicious. But all this is keeping us from poor Lily. Won't you try again? No, not just now. I'm afraid it would be useless now, Mrs. DeVries. But if you like, I'll resume my efforts tonight. Alone. surprises? Do you like fun? And do you like to meet famous personalities? Then you're sure to like the Amos and Andy Music Hall. The Amos and Andy Music Hall, located in the grand ballroom of the Lodge of the Mystic Knights of the Sea, is presided over by three of your favorites, the Kingfish, Amos, and Andy. Every weekday evening, Monday through Friday, over most of these same CBS radio stations, they play host to you and to one or more of the top stars in show business, who's a featured surprise guest. People like Jack Benny, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Frank Sinatra, Doris Day, Judy Garland, Tony Martin, and lots of other exciting big-name stars drop in to join the fun, the variety, and the music at the Amos and Andy Music Hall. Why don't you drop in, too? Remember, the Amos and Andy Music Hall comes to you every weekday evening, Monday through Friday, over most of these same CBS radio stations. It's a treat for all the family. Now we continue with The Green and Gold String, starring Mr. Vincent Price. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was nearly six when Abby and I left the DeVries house and headed for a little restaurant in Nyack where the Shadro used to be excellent. <laughs> it still is. Well, now that you've satisfied the inner man, Abby, could I have a report? Well, I found out a lot about this debris guy from the servants, but I don't know if it helped. He's, he's around 40 to 45. Uh, considerably younger than his wife. Yeah, he's been married to her about five years. Uh, they rub along okay, but no hard throbs, at least not with him. Uh. But he likes polo ponies and sailboats, and she's got the dough. Ah, uh, very good, Abby. Now, one or two questions. Hold it, I ain't finished. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, as to Sir Clinton's recent whereabouts, he's got his boat moored somewhere out on Long Island Sound. You see, she's got a beach house out there, and that's where he went morning of the day this lily was killed. And he's still there? Yeah, but he's due home tomorrow. Time for dinner. Huh? Now, make with your questions. Avi, I haven't a one. You've really covered the ground. I'm proud of you. Well, then it's your turn, brother. Seeing as we spent nearly our last dime hoping to horn in on that five grand reward, I think you ought to fill me in. With pleasure, Abby. First, I know who killed Lily. Then let's spill it to the cops and collect. Not so fast. I found out something else. The same killers planning to kill again. I think soon. Lily was murdered only because of something she found out. Yeah? What? This man, this killer, has been sending presents to Mrs. DeVries. Books, perfume, candy. 
Well, it's my guess that someday soon, the candy will be the death of her. And will he watch his found out who he is? Indubitably. And since the dame you're talking about is the DeVries dame, then I suppose you right. think... The guy is the DeVries guy. Well, hey, Doc, it couldn't be. He was out on Long Island. No, Abby, he was hiding, waiting for Lily Morton. Look, it was easy. He started out in the morning ostensibly for Long Island, but instead he hid his car and lay low the whole day. He knew the shortcut Lily always took from the bus stop through the back of the estate. And that's where he killed her. Then he drove off to the beach house, where he was supposed to have been all day. And I suppose you got all that from your crystal ball. No, no, from Lily Morton a few hours before she was killed. No way, you're reaching, Doc. I told you I knew one thing the police don't know. Yeah, if it was this Clint, you said yourself you got no proof, and Lily ain't doing no talking now. Terse, Savvy, to the point. You're getting better and better. So what do we do? Pick us a park bench, sit around getting corns, waiting for Mr. Clint George to send his frau a popsicle full of strychnine. <laughs> I don't think we'd have very long to wait. I think he's about ready to strike. But since our funds will only see us through another day at the most... You said a mouthful It's where? up to us to smoke him out. And I have an idea just how to do it. Oh, good afternoon, Dr. Alcazar. Forgive me for bothering you at this time, dear lady, just when your husband's returned. Why, that's... Well, I have, shall we say, certain sources of information. You found out something? Yes, something startling, almost unbelievable. But I, I must check it further before... I... Oh, but I have to know. Can't you tell me? I, I'd rather not. Not on the telephone. Oh, then you come to dinner, please. Oh, no, no, no. That would be imposing. Nonsense. I've told Clinton all about you. Indeed? I warn you, he's a terrible skeptic. But you can convince him. I know you. Sure, for a cognac, doctor? Well, yes, yes, thank you, Mr. DeVries. Oh, now, doctor, do tell me what's happened. I told Clinton about your seeing Lily and the crystal, and about the paper and string. Ah, that string, that green and gold string. Curious, you must admit, Mr. DeVries. <clears throat> Very curious. Indeed, yes. And if I sounded excited when I phoned, I was. You see, Mr. Mrs. DeVries, I, I've been at work on our problem, and suddenly I saw, or rather I sensed, that the tissue paper and the green and gold string were not part of your psychic stream. Whose, then? Lily Morton. Lily? But why? What could George mean to Lily? I believe he killed her. George? Why, that is the most preposterous idea. Uh, are you sure? And to be frank, no, but I'm convinced that... One more evocation of the psychmantic waves will bring confirmation or the reverse. Oh, Doctor, then couldn't you do it here tonight? Well, I could try, unless Mr. DeVries objects. No, go ahead. As a matter of fact, I'd like to sit in. Excellent. I was hoping you would. Is the room dark enough? Quite, thank you. Oh, what nonsense. Clinton, don't fidget. Ah, uh, I hear is something. It's clouding. Yes. I can see the green and gold serpent on the violet background. And now I see a man. Is it George? I don't know. I can only see his back. His shoulders shake. And he is laughing, an evil, malevolent laugh. George has done nothing evil. He's only... The picture is changing. Now I see this room. It is morning, and there is a package on the desk, wrapped in violet paper. A woman enters. It's you, Gloria. You see the package, and you're delighted. Be careful, Gloria. You think this is a gift sent with love, but it is sent only to lull you into a false sense of security. Why? Why? Because one day, someday, a package will come that will spell your death. <coughs> Clinton. The image is changing. It's another room now, and... Lily Morton is there. She is staring in amazement at something she has found, a ball of green and gold string and a roll of violet tissue paper. And finding them has shown her the identity of George. She knew and never told me. Lily is 
troubled by her knowledge. She doesn't know what to do. She takes a sheet of the paper, a little coil of the string, and she is gone. And now the image of George again. Still, I, I cannot see his face, but he is staring after Lily. He knows she has discovered him. And he knows she might tell. Perhaps. But now we are in a place of shadows. George is lurking there, waiting. He hears Lily's footsteps. He tenses. He leaps at her and seizes her by the throat. Oh. Now she is motionless, lifeless. He bends down and finds her purse. Takes something from it with his gloved hand. The paper and the string. He's stealing away. If only, only I could see his face. Try. You must try. Wait. At last. At last he is turning. We are going to see his face. He... That's enough. Stay where you are, both of you. Don't move. Clinton, you killed Lily. And you, too, if you're not quiet. Your plan with the candy might have worked, Mr. DeVries, but with a gun, you don't have a chance. Shut up. Gloria, open the safe and take out the money you put there this morning. Come on, move. Oh, all right. Okay, DeVries, that'll do. Drop the gun. Hey, what? You... Oh! Oh! I'm sorry, lady, but it was him or me. Oh. Him or all of us. That was very terse, Abby. Completely to the point. You've really got a grasp for this kind of work. Abby! Abby! Yeah, boss? Look what just arrived in the mail. Oh, oh. oh the same. Gloria Drews. Has she sent us the five Gs? Take a look. Ten. Ten Gs. Doc, what are we going to do? Well, what do you suggest? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, we could split it and quit. Each of us do what we want. Abby, you'd let money break up our winning combination. But not me, Doc. Good. Then let's use our hard-gotten games to set you and me up in business. Business? What kind of business? Alcazar Associates. Private investigators, with you doing the legwork and me reading the crystal ball, we're a cinch to make a million. Suspense. In which Vincent Price starred in The Green and Gold String, adapted by Sylvia Richards from a story by Philip MacDonald and produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Miss Nancy Kelly in Trial by Jury, another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Supporting Mr. Price in the green and gold string were Jeanette Nolan, Irene Tedrow, Lou Krugman, Byron Kane, and Ben Wright. Ever hear of the Vandals? That group of savages who bucketed around over most of Europe, destroying everything that was beautiful? According to history, they lived and did their damage over 1,400 years ago. But sometimes one wonders if the vandals really died out. Certainly there's a group roaming America, especially during the outdoor months, that acts like the vandals of old. You've seen their work. They're the ones who make sure our picnic spots and roadsides are littered with sandwich wrappings, pop bottles, and beer cans. It's carelessness, not viciousness, that prompts their destructive behavior. Could be that you yourself have been careless in that fashion once or twice. Now, make a vow against it. Do your part to help keep America beautiful. You hear America's favorite shows on the CBS radio network.